Well, here we are, another Sabbath. I think I mentioned this last week on the live stream. It's just, I can't believe it's been, I mean, October, as we count in man's world, October's almost over, heading towards November. Um, the feast is four weeks behind or so. It's just, time's flying by. I see that where I work, you know, at the school. You know, days go by quick. Weeks go by. I'm very thankful. I'm glad the Sabbath's at the end of every week so we can come together and rest and worship God. But uh, it's just, it's, a re- it's relaxing. It's nice. And especially in the times that we live in, you know, times that we've gone through the past four weeks or so as a, as a body of Christ. Um, I think I said this a couple weeks ago. It's just, we're being tested. We're being, I don't know, just my own personal view. It kind of reminds me of Job, where our enemy went before the throne of God and said, it says, does Job fear you for nothing? It's almost like when we trace things back to what's happened the past four weeks, it's almost like, I don't know if it happened. It's just my, that's how my mind works. It's like Job, where our enemy said, do they fear you for nothing? And maybe God's, allowed, I mean, obviously God's let us go through all this for a reason, and maybe pulled the hedge back. I'm not, I'm not saying that's doctrine or anything. Just something to think about. Are we being tested? Are we pulling our full trust in God? Are we... We talked about before um, the past year or so with the COVID going on. Is this, is, is this a warning? Is this a warning to the churches? Is it time to wake up? With the signs that we see in the skies, you know, we saw several years ago, with the tetrad, the moon tetrads, and with the alignment of the stars, are these warnings to the churches to, are you doing all that you can to stay on course? To trust in Almighty God? The choice is ours, has always been ours. Uh, God is big on choice. He doesn't force anything on people. He may open our minds, which he has, and I've been saying that for the past um, few weeks, that what a miracle it is that he's chosen us. He's opened our minds. Whether it's, like I said, I've said before many times, whether you're hearing or your mind's open to God's word for the very first time or we've been in the body of Christ for 30, 40 years or so, what a miracle it is to have God touch our minds and open us up to the truth. And what we have at stake being part of that truth, the goal of the kingdom, it's, it's so precious. At the feast, I talked about that pearl and the armor. The kids, the children's lessons were based on the the pearl of great price and also the armor. And that pearl of great price, that's God's truth and His calling that He's given to us. And we want to hold on to it as as hard, you know, just as much as we can, not lose that pearl of great price. Because that's part of our journey in this life. Whatever God has seen in us, it's something special. And He's touched our minds. You know, it's just interesting to see how God works this past week because Tom's email that he sent, although he cannot right now physically do news nuggets and insights as a program, getting the emails out and talking about we see the world continuing to deteriorate, to go to what the ultimate culmination will be so that Christ has to return, will return. And as I said, I spoke with Bruce Chapman yesterday and he was just talking about trusting in God and making sure that we are full focused uh, with our trust towards God and just there, the same mindset. So and I appreciate you know, when I talk with Bruce and, and of course we talk with Steve and we just come together and other ministers and other people of the church just come together and we just start talking. It's so inspiring. Because it can, life, life, if you haven't noticed, this life can get us down. It can wear on us. And I said a couple weeks ago that is this part of the wearing down of the saints? Could it be? 
You know, we're losing people. And that's just the truth. That's what's happened the past four weeks since the feast. You know, not just our organization. That's why I say it's the body of Christ. There are people being lost, but we know the truth. If they pass, pass away, and they are in the faith, they've been guaranteed. They're, they're locked in. They're locked in, awaiting their resurrection and to be raised up in part of that glorious future, of that glorious promise. But as we look here in this world and we see what's happening, and again, as I've just made mention, we always have choice. And we, we have choice, the world has choice, choices. And the consequences of those choices. Let's turn to Ezekiel. Ezekiel 18. Ezekiel 18. Ezekiel is told and is written, is, writes down the inspired word of the Lord. Ezekiel 18, verse 29. She says, Yet the house of Israel says, The way of the Lord is not fair. O house of Israel, is it not? My ways which are fair, and your ways which are not fair. The carnal mind wants to say that's not fair. The world which is deceived, they are deceived. Our enemy has been allowed to deceive the world. A deceived mind will say that's not fair. But God returns and says, O house of Israel, is it not? My ways which are fair and your ways which are not fair. He says, therefore, I will judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his ways, says the Lord God. Repent and turn from all your transgressions so that iniquity will not be your ruin. Cast away from you all the transgressions which you have committed and get yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. For why should you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of one who dies, says the Lord God. Therefore, turn and live. And many messages have been given throughout the years about God is patient. God is full of mercy. And He, he doesn't find pleasure in those who would make the choice to turn from Him and do things that are full of iniquity or sinfulness. He's very patient. We see that in the Old Testament with the nation of Israel. Very patient. But it gets to a point where he finally had to remove the house of Israel and later on the house of Judah because it just got to a point where they, a consequence was leveled. And we see that going on in the world around us today. It is getting worse. It's getting worse every day every week, and eventually leading into the return of our Savior, Jesus Christ. But just before that, and we had a wonderful Bible study over the summer about the book of Revelation. Maybe it was, a, a, maybe it was just a little bit before summer. Maybe it was last spring. It was a wonderful Bible study looking at Revelation and seeing the consequences that will be on this world for making the choice to not listen and not take heed of the things that our, our God says should be done. Ezekiel chapter 8. Ezekiel 8 is the chapter where in vision... God, Lord God, takes Ezekiel through Jerusalem to the temple. The vision of idolatries that encompassed the temple in Jerusalem. 
They saw many wicked things. I'm not going to read through the whole chapter. You may, you may do that. But he said, I'm going to pick it up near the end, verse 13. And he said to me, turn again and you will see greater abominations that they are doing. His own people were doing things that were evil, making the choice to do these evil things and these, having these abominations before the Lord God. So it's verse 13, and he said to me, turn again and you will see greater abominations that they are doing. So he brought me to the door of the north gate of the Lord's house, and to my dismay, women were sitting there weeping for Tammuz. And Tammuz is a, is a pagan god, is an idol. A, Sumer- a Sumerian fertility god. Instead of his people you know, praising and worshiping the Lord God, maybe even weeping before the Lord God, for whatever reason, they were weeping before an idol, a false god. Then he said to me, Have you seen this, O son of man? Turn again, and you will see greater abominations than these. So he brought me into the inner court at the Lord's house, and there at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about twenty-five men, with their backs toward the temple of the Lord, and their faces toward the east. And they were worshiping the sun toward the east. So sun worship. And this does bring visions, not vision, this is a vision, but to our mind, what we've talked about for so many years, is this the worship of Ishtar? And that we see in the world in the springtime, when the world, they have early morning service on a Sunday in the spring, and they worship towards the east on the day that the world calls Easter. It looks like that, but they're worshiping the sun no matter what. The inspired word of God says God's people were facing east and worshiping the sun toward the east. They weren't worshiping God. They were put something else in its place, which was the sun. That star that we, that we have in our solar system, that this earth goes around. And he said to me in verse 17, Have you seen this, O son of man? Is it a trivial thing to the house of Judah to commit the abominations which they, which they commit here? For they have filled the land with violence. Then they have returned to provoke me to anger. And indeed, they put the branch to their nose. Therefore, I also will act in fury. My eye will not spare, nor will I have pity. And though they cry in my ears with a loud voice, I will not hear them. And so, the consequence would be leveled against Judah. Also, it projects to our future. The end of the age. We're God's people. And this world will make a choice. And for many centuries, the world has made a choice. Even though they are deceived, they have made a choice to worship other things than God. Whether it's false gods, idols, whether it's money they put before, or whatever, whatever the case. Ideologies they have put before the Lord God And there will be consequences for that. And the requirement of our Savior to return with His people being resurrected or changed. You know, I just kind of think, you know, when you pray, when we pray and we think, we meditate on God's Word. As I said earlier, it's a miracle. Never forget that. It's a miracle that your mind, our minds have been touched. To understand what God is trying to tell us in His truth and His way. Can you imagine a world where God didn't do that? Of course, we wouldn't know any different. We wouldn't know any different. We wouldn't be here today. We wouldn't be at the Holy... uh, We wouldn't be at any of the weekly Sabbath days. We wouldn't be at the annual Holy Days. We wouldn't know the truth... But for a moment, if we could just step outside of ourselves for a moment and think, what would this world look like if there was God decided just to let it go as is? 
I don't know if the world will be around. I really don't. I mean, but by his love and his mercy, he's called people throughout the generations. From the very beginning of man, he's called people out to, t- to show them the truth and to see if they would choose to hang on to that truth. We should praise God and thank God for the truth that we have, for the miracle of that whenever that day was for you when you just felt it, that something's not right in the world. That's what I'm saying. Something's not right in the world. There's a different feeling. There's something different out there that I need to find. And that would go into God's truth. What what a blessing. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. So we've made a choice to follow God. We've made a choice to hold on, to hold fast. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And I know... Sometimes we read and we read some of the same scriptures and we say, oh, that's old. We know that. But we get such inspiration from all scripture. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 7. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. So those of us who have made the choice to say, yeah, there's something different that I need to find. And it leads us to God's truth. And it leads us to accepting Jesus Christ as our Savior. And it leads to the choice of being baptized. And the hands laid upon us of receiving part of the Father's Spirit, that Holy Spirit, That's what Paul is talking about here. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. We're earthen. We're clay. We're designed to die. We are. As mortal humans, we are designed to die. That the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. To give glory to God. To say thank you, Father, for seeing something. To give us this choice. And you've given us, Father, part of you inside of us. We are hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. We've been through many things as a people. As the body of Christ. We've been through many, many things. And the truth is, we've been through a lot the past four weeks. And it, ha- it does wear on you. It does wear. But we can't forget the goal can't forget the goal. And it says in verse 13, and since we've had the same spirit of faith according to what is written, I believed and therefore I spoke. We also believe and therefore speak, knowing that He who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus and will present us with you. See that we know that hope. We understand that hope. With the ones that we've lost, and I'm not just talking about the past month, four weeks, but we've lost others in the past. And it hurts when we lose someone. Because we won't, see, you know, physically we won't see them again. But this hope is He will raise them up and present them with those who are still around when He comes. The second time. For all things are for your sakes that grace having spread through the many may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart. He 
Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. And that's a choice. We can allow our inward man, the spirit that guides us, to be shut off. Or we can allow it to be renewed day by day in prayer, in meditation, in talking with each other, as I said, iron sharpening iron. The Word of God, the truth of God. To lift us up. Like I said, I was on the phone with Bruce last night. There he is sitting next to Myrna. And he gave me inspiration just by talking with him. Talking about trusting God. Putting your trust with Him. Don't forget that. Do not lose heart, Paul says. In verse 17, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. And we have to remember that. Our light affliction. Paul calls it our light affliction. When we're going through something, it doesn't seem very light. It doesn't. It seems very heavy. And it hurts. It could hurt physically. It could hurt emotionally. It could hurt spiritually. But Paul calls it our light affliction. Which is but for a moment is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. To the kingdom. To the eternal life. And even though we've been hurt, we've also seen the miracles. We've seen the miracles that God performs. Not only in our own lives, but in other people's lives. We've seen the miracles. I'd like to echo Tom in his email. The body of Christ has come together, maybe not physically, in the different buildings across the nation, or across the world, but the body of Christ has come together in spirit and prayed and come before our Father's throne to pray. We've been praying for each other. That our Father in heaven would look down and see and take care of us. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Chapter 5, verse 1, For if we know that if our earthly house, this tent is destroyed, we have a building from God. A house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed with our new habitation, which is from heaven. We should pray that. Thy kingdom come. Please send your son. Remember your promise? I mean, remember your promise? We can say that. We can say that to our Father in heaven when we're in prayer. Remember it says in Matthew 24, you will cut time short. That's okay to say. Do you remember your promise? Please, Father, let that promise come true. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. First Corinthians 2, verse 1. And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. Again, this is Paul talking to the people at the church there in Corinth. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I was with you in weakness and fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, 
but in the power of God. Must continue to have, seek the wisdom of God and the power of God. It says in verse 6, However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age. And when we think about that for a moment, we look at outside the world right now. The wisdom of this age. And, you know, I know Paul speaking of the age that he was living in. But, you know, it works for our age too. We look out there, is there any wisdom out there? Really? Well, the humans out there think there's wisdom and but it's not the wisdom of God, of His truth. He says, Yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age, who are coming to nothing. The world doesn't see the train wreck. The world doesn't see the disaster impending you know, on the doorstep that they've, we, the world has created. But verse 7, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love Him. And that's what we need to pray. Father, increase our insight. Increase our knowledge. Help us. Because we, we love You, Father. We made the choice to follow Your truth. Help us. Guide us. Let these things that you have for us enter into our hearts and our minds. Verse 10, but God has revealed them to us through his spirit, for the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. And if you think about it, how much, has you, how much have you grown in knowledge of God in the years since you, we've, you've made the choice, I've made the choice to be baptized? How have you grown? For what, man knows, for what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. Now we have received, not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is from God that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things, that he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ, and we grow in that. We grow in that. We're still human. Pinch yourself. You felt it, didn't you? You're still human. But we have that spirit in us and we make the choice how to use it. Do we grow? Do we, through prayer, reach out through that spirit and ask God to increase our knowledge, increase our faith, increase you know, our strength to face what we have to face on a daily basis. And we all walk a different walk of life. We all do. We all face different things based on our walk of life. As a teacher, I face things on a daily basis that some of you don't face. And you face things on a daily basis that I don't face. 
but we have the Spirit to help us overcome if we choose to come before God. And it says to love Him, and He has things for us to grow and to help us overcome. Hebrews 13. Hebrews 13. Hebrews 13, verse 5 and 6, some instruction to the, you know, the spiritual body, which we are part of. Hebrews 13, verse 5 and 6 says, Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That comes from the Old Testament. That comes from Joshua chapter 1. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? So it's written for us to take in and make that choice how we should be. How should we act? If God is for us, who can be against us? As it's written in other Scripture. I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say. See, it's a two-way street. It's a partnership. It's the love between Creator and creation. His called out ones. The Lord is my helper. I will not fear what can man do to me? And that's hard. I mean, that's hard. As physical beings, that's hard. That's where that trust comes in God. The choice to trust Him, to rely on Him, even though He may make us go through things we don't want to go through. And we may feel things that we don't want to feel. We may hurt. But there are times that we feel the joy. You can't, you can't talk about just the one. You've got to talk about both sides. The happiness. The joy. And it says in verse 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's the same. Teaching's the same, been the same since the beginning of time to the end of the age and beyond. Our Savior's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And His love is without end. And His teachings are without end. And it says in verse 9, Do not be carried about with various and strange doctrines. For it is good that the heart be established by grace, not with foods which have not profited those who have been occupied with them. You know, we can't get caught up in the world. We watch the world. We watch and we pray always. But we can't get caught up with various and strange doctrines that do not belong to our Savior. That do not belong to our Father. We have the choice to continue on the, the path that we've been put on. That we've chosen to be on. And we have a choice to come before. If something comes across our way, we're not sure, but we pray. We have the choice to pray. Or we have a choice to call somebody. Say, hey, can you help me out on this? What, what, do you think, you know, what, what do you think? I can't find it in Scripture to help me out here. We have a choice to believe and trust in what we've been taught. 2 Peter chapter 1 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16. And this is the, you know, the Apostle Peter writing his letter to the churches. He says, For we did not follow cunningly devised 
fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. So Peter's coming out and saying, we didn't tell you fables. The person Jesus that we talk about, he wasn't fake. We didn't make him up. But we were eyewitnesses of who he was and his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. So Peter's just laying down the credentials. We were there. We saw it. We're telling you about it. And it's real. So he continues and says, So we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed, as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. So he's saying, Take heed. He is the Christ, He's returning. His majesty. John 17. So basically what Peter was saying there as we're turning to John 17 is we saw it, we witnessed it, we wrote it down. We're telling you, take heed. The words that are inspired by God. John 17. Verse 14. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. So these are our Savior's own words. And we read this every spring, the Lord's Supper. The time frame is that evening, just before he was betrayed by Judas and arrested. And he's praying. He's praying before the Father. And he says, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. And as you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctified myself that they also may be sanctified by the truth. So we just had Peter say, take heed. Because he, he was alive. He's not a fable. He was there. We were there with him. We saw it. So take heed. Then we have these words of our Savior praying for His disciples of that time and of the future to the end of the age. The truth is God's truth. Sanctify them, he's saying, by your truth. Your word is truth as he's praying to the Father. But he says in verse 20, to back up what I just said, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. Through their word, the disciples' word, what was written down, the letters that have made it to us, combined with the books of the Old Testament, to show the truth, the path, the goal of the kingdom, of eternal life. That's, that's, that's beautiful. That's awesome. You know, and, he, and He prays for us today. There's our Savior before the throne of the Father. We are saved by His life. We're forgiven 
by His death. Our sins are covered by His blood. But we are saved by His life. He lives to defend us. He's doing that on a daily basis in heaven right now. Father, your, your way is truth. Help them understand your truth. They, they stumble. They fall. They hurt. They make bad choices. But look at, your, look at the body. You know, he's saying, look at the ones that you've called. You know, even if they stumble and they fall, they're asking for forgiveness. Forgive them. Pick them up. Help them. Galatians chapter 6. Speaking of choice, speaking of what we need to focus on, Galatians 6, verse 7. Paul writes and says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. I say it it a lot when I speak of Paul. Paul was the ultimate cheerleader. You can make it. You can do it. Do it this way. God's truth. Read it. Embrace it. Understand it to the best of your ability. Ask for growth in the knowledge. Don't grow weary. Some of us are weary. Some of us are weary. Some of us are weary. So he says, don't grow weary. Some of us get weary. Things weigh on us and we grow weary. It says, do not lose heart. We just read that in a few Scriptures before, a few minutes ago. Do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are the household of faith. Isaiah 40. Isaiah 40. Isaiah 40, verse 29. Now, I know I read this. I know I wasn't here two weeks ago, but online I did read this Scripture and I thought it was just appropriate for today. Isaiah 40, verse 29. He gives power to the weak, and to those who have no might, He increases strength. Speaking of our Lord God. Even the youth shall faint and be weary. And the young, man, young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not, and not faint. Our job is to listen to obey the Word of God, the truth, His truth, as written down for us in Scripture. He will guide. He will protect. Again, we may go through rough spots. Is He testing to see where our hearts lay? Is He testing to see if we will listen and allow Him to guide us? I think of the example of the Passover where they were all the the nation of Israel in Goshen. 
before they were pulled out, before the Exodus, that first Passover that they were told to keep, how would they, how would they be protected in Goshen? What did they need to do so when the angel of death, the messenger of death, that plague that came across would not touch them? They had to listen and obey. They were given very strict instructions. You shall take the Passover lamb on the 10th and you will kill it on the evening the going down on the 14th of the sun. And you will put the blood on the doorposts and on the lintels. And if they did that, their firstborn would not die. They had to listen and obey. They had to trust God, the Lord God. There they were for 430 years in captivity. They lost the Sabbath day. They lost the annual holy days. They cried out. The Lord God heard them and they said, okay, you want to survive? You listen. You listen to these instructions. That's the same for us today. Listen and obey. Colossians 2 Colossians 2. Colossians 2, verse 1. And again, this is Paul writing one of his letters. Colossians 2, verse 1 says, For I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, and attaining to all the riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. See, we've been kind of on that path today in the, in the message, finding that wisdom, growing in that wisdom and knowledge Whether, like I said earlier, whether it's the first time hearing it, or we've been doing this 30, 40 years, or beyond. Now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. That's what the world's all about, persuasive words. Again, we have to be careful. For though I am absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. Walk in Christ. What He stood for, what He taught, what He passed along through Scripture to us. rooted and built up in Him and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Then he, again, he continues, says, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. If it's not of Christ, we don't want it. That's what Paul's saying. For in Him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in Him who is the head of all principality and power. That's all we need. We need Christ. And through Christ, we get to know the Father. I just, it's just beautiful. It's wonderful. It's awesome. Again, the promise... That through our Savior Jesus Christ, we get to know the Father as well. We 
get to know the Father. 2 Peter 3. Second Peter chapter three. Again, familiar scriptures for some of us. Verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, see, this is the next part here. Peter just, I, I like how Peter's very blunt. See, Paul, Paul was the great cheerleader. Peter's the blunt one. What manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? We know this is coming. We know the end of the age is coming. We know our Savior is returning. So as we know this and we're being taught this and we're asking for insight, we're asking for knowledge, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? That's what Peter's asking. We see in verse 13, Nevertheless, we according to His promise look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness, righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by Him in peace, without spot and blameless. That's what we're working for. And we're not there yet. We're human. Again, I said that earlier. We're human. We're still natural. We're not spirit, but we're working on obtaining that. We're working on getting there. And that one day, that reward when our Savior returns will complete the process of becoming fully spiritual. Let's go to 1 Peter. Let's back up a letter. 1 Peter chapter 4. First Peter 4, verse 12. He says, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. So when we go through these trials, it's part of the plan. It's not something strange happening to you. God's allowing it to happen for His reasons, His glory. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings that when His glory is revealed you may also be glad with exceeding joy. So we take that in. What another promise. And we're thankful for that. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 9. As we're coming to a close here today. 1 Corinthians 9. And again, I know we've hit a lot of maybe familiar scriptures for some of us, but they're encouraging scriptures. We take them in and we look at them and we study them. And they're meant to encourage us to overcome and be strong during the tests, the trials. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 24, Paul writes, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Now he's talking about a physical race. Physical race. You know, this past summer we saw the Olympics and in the different races and competitions, the top three got something. The rest didn't. He says, Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown. So that physical race, it's a perishable thing. Those medals, those trophies will tarnish. It will get old, may fall apart. But we for an imperishable crown. 
eternal life. The promise of God to His creation. That you can obtain eternal life if you listen and you obey. He says, Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty, thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. So Paul's saying, I'm, I'm striving just like you. I've got to do it too. I don't want to become disqualified. As we, I want to read from the message version of that scripture. 1 Corinthians 9. Verse 24. In the message version of Scripture, it says, You've all been to the stadium and seen the athletes race. Everyone runs, one wins. Run to win. All good athletes train hard. They do it for a gold medal that tarnishes and fades. You're after, you're after one that's gold eternally. He says, I don't know about you, but I'm running hard for the finish line. I'm giving it everything I've got. No sloppy living for me. I'm staying alert and in top condition. I'm not going to get caught napping, telling everyone else all about it, and then missing out myself. So Paul was doing the same thing. Do it right. Stay alert. Top condition. How do we do that spiritually? Prayer. Meditation. Reading. Taking in the Word of God. The truth. Life comes at us. Physical life comes at us. Sometimes we're, we feel unprepared. It comes out of the blue. Whatever that may be. We can't give up. We've got to be strong. Have strength through the Word of God. Rely on God. Trust in His Word. We do battle each day. And we are tested. We strive to overcome each day. And we know from Scripture, we know in our hearts, we know because God has shown us that we have a King and a Savior. We know from reading. We know, we know, we know that Christ is alive. And He is qualified to bring a new kingdom to this earth. We have been called to be part of that. We have been called to stand up for the righteousness of Almighty God. We have been called to be the forerunners of that kingdom that will arrive. May God continue to strengthen us, to guide us on our journey through the ups and the downs, through the tests and the trials, so that we can come out on the other side washed white, having that promise of eternal life, and being there to help Him reign eternally.